I'm delighted to say that we've got our resident expert uh, geochemist uh, giving the talk tonight, and that's Professor Keith Nicholson. You'll, you'll get to see Keith in a moment, but many of you will know him already from a number of talks that he's given, all relating to the uh, solar system and giving us a bit of insight into the understanding of the the geology of different parts of the, the, the solar system. You can see him in the bottom left hand corner of the screen, giving a, a recent talk on the planet Mars. So tonight he's going a little bit further away in the solar system to the outer reaches to one of Saturn's moons. Yeah, Saturn's moon, Enceladus, uh, part of the Cassini mission uh, was to have a look at uh, a flyby uh, Enceladus several times and has produced some really spectacular images, uh, which in themselves are just a delight to, to see, but also some uh, really quite interesting uh, analysis uh, of the uh, chemistry of Enceladus and uh, giving some implications on, on the evolution of the moon uh, and uh, uh, some of the unusual features, the oceans and geysers, which we'll talk about, uh, and the possibility of life, which always is uh, an intriguing possibility. So what I want to do is, is uh, just a, an outline of the contents for, for tonight. Uh, I'm just going to set the scene really, the context for uh, Enceladus, where its position is in the uh, Saturnian system, a bit of a history of discovery and exploration, again, just to set context. And then we'll start to get into some of the data or the results of uh, of the Cassini mission and the subsequent data analysis, looking at the geological structure, some of the uh, geyser chemistry and, and hydrothermal activity, and the implications on the ge from the geochemistry for the evolution of, of the moon. And, and indeed, the implications for possibilities of, of life. And just to set the scene, obviously this is the Earth and, and the moon, and this is the in relative scale of Enceladus. So really not a very large, uh, moon at all, uh, relative to our moon and, of course, the Earth. So to position it within the uh, Saturnian system, well, obviously it's Saturn and the various rings, uh, and Enceladus lies here. It's the second nearest of the, the major moons of, of Saturn, um, uh, sixth largest and, and easily the brightest uh, moon of Saturn because it's effectively just an ice ball and there's a very high albino uh, as a consequence of that. About 300 odd miles in diameter, um, and really quite modest in terms of the Saturn system, because of course Titan uh, on the outermost reaches of, of this diagram uh, is the largest. You'll notice its position within the E-ring, and we'll talk about that a, a, a little more in a, in a moment. Uh, and uh, Enceladus is actually the cause of, of this diffuse ring. So um, it's interesting in its own right. Uh, and of course, the relationship with Enceladus itself is, is intriguing. This is an image um, actually taken. It's not a, not a photo montage. It's a, a, a genuine image of uh, Saturn at the, the, just above the plane of the rings. And, and we can see Janus, Pandora, Enceladus, and uh, Rie uh, in this scene. So it's, uh, it's a really nice image. And, something I quite, I quite like seeing because it, it shows the relative position of Enceladus as well, just slightly above the plane. There. And there's a few other images that we'll show you later on that uh, indicate that too. And of course, Cassini has produced some really spectacular images and I can never resist uh, when we get really quite a, almost an emotional image, I think, really of the earth as a wee blue dot in, in this vast ocean of space. Uh, and it just is, it's quite humiliating, but it, it's just quite awe-inspiring every time I see these, these sorts of images. Um, so a bit of self-indulgence there, but I think it's quite spectacular. So back to the E-ring. Um, I've just, this is a false color, obviously, uh, uh, of the, of the E-ring. Um, quite diffuse um, and uh, really quite, um, yeah, well, quite diffuse, uh, composed of uh, iron particles, uh, not iron particles, ice particles. Uh, and these are some good images here, again from Cassini, uh, 
Uh, it was discovered in 1966, just, just micrometer sized particles of, of water ice, um, condensed from plumes of vapor ejected by the geysers on, on Enceladus. And there's a couple of images here, one uh, from a distance from a uh, distant shot from uh, Cassini, and another one in infrared showing the plume quite clearly from these geysers. Uh, and Enceladus just above the plane of the rings here and, and here. And a uh, view of it in uh, apparently from this perspective, so sort of within the ring. So you can see this diffuse uh, ring, quite intense and the orbit of Enceladus, but diffusing out quite a way to uh, in excess of two and a half thousand miles from the moon, which is quite um, quite extraordinary. Again, a bit of a self-indulgent picture because I simply I like it. Uh, I just think it's a spectacular picture, but it does have its purpose in, in showing again the, the diffuse E-ring here. So backlit um, Saturn and its rings, uh, quite spectacular. So what's the history of discovery of Enceladus? Well, 1789, it was discovered by William Herschel, but interestingly, it wasn't named until 1847. And that naming was suggested by his son, John Herschel, and has been adopted since then, uh, named after the giant of Greek mythology, uh, as commonly with uh, all the moons of, of Saturn. It wasn't until 1980 that we got a view of Enceladus from Voyager 1, quite a distant view, as we'll see in a moment. But it was Voyager 2 and the higher resolution cameras that really give us some first images of, of Enceladus. And then, of course, a decade of Cassini flybys have really just um, enhanced our knowledge and and perspective of Enceladus, and indeed made it even more intriguing than it already was. So we've got um, uh, the flight paths here of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And, and whilst they both did fly by Saturn, the Voyager 1 cameras uh, didn't have the same resolution as, as Voyager 2. And, and as you can see here, it, it was a more distant flyby anyway. But you can see here that, that you can't really see a lot of um, uh, features on the moon, even with enhancement, it's still quite quite vague. And by contrast, <clears throat> you can see the uh, uh, really much better images of of Enceladus from the um, uh, from Voyager 2's imaging. In fact, Voyager 2 imaging is really quite interesting. And what I want to do, I'll come back to this in a moment. But what I want you to just to look at here is clearly the cratered surface. But if you look at the southern pole, you can see here it's relatively smooth, some fractures, um, but but not a huge amount of features. And that's really quite in contrast to what we see today. And that's that's uh, become quite important in looking at the evolution of of the moon. So we can see here um, an image that I, I, I really like to see um, that of uh, Titan and Enceladus here, taken from Cassini, a distance of just over 4 million kilometers from Enceladus and, and 5 million from, from Titan. Shows the relative sizes really well, just, you know, despite the differences. And of course, the differential in color. Uh, and Titan itself is a, is a story in itself, really, of, of just what's uh, very different about Titan as a moon. And here at the classic imaging now of Enceladus from, from Cassini. And there are many images of this nature uh, that are really quite spectacular. So let me just see if I can get this to move on. Yeah, our technology is taking over. Right, just a second. Shall just try to get this to progress. So we can see here the the flybys uh, of of Cassini, uh, a total of twenty four in in total. Um, uh, and some of them really quite 
quite extraordinarily close to the surface of the moon. The closest has been 24 kilometers. Uh, and this is a, an image from the North Pole uh, showing some extraordinary resolution. And you can see some of the fractures uh, in the North Pole here, and obviously some of the craters as well. The North Pole is quite interesting in contrast to the South Pole, as we'll, we'll see in a, in a moment. So it's quite helpful for you just to see this um, by contrast to, to what we'll see on, on, on the South Pole. But it is thought that the North Pole was quite active fairly recently, and, and that's an interesting story in itself. So we can see uh, Enceladus here, uh, again, just for scale, it, uh, it's uh, really very small, uh, quite extraordinary when you see it in, in relation to the British Isles. Uh, and still the sixth largest moon of Saturn, as I've said, 300 odd miles in kilometre. It takes 33 hours to orbit uh, Saturn, and the orbit is almost circular. It's at a bit distance of just under 150,000 miles. Um, but interestingly, the, the average density is 60% greater than that of water. Uh, and that, together with some magnetometry and gravity measurements, have, have led to uh, conclusions about the interior and the structure of Enceladus that we'll have a look at it in a moment. Uh, it, it's interesting because it's in contrast to its neighboring moons, uh, which are largely composed of, of water ice, uh, or ice in general, including a large proportion of water ice. So Enceladus in itself, even with its own system, it looks quite unusual. Um, it reflects almost all the light that uh, falls upon it, uh, contrast with our own moon of about 7%. Uh, and that's because it's almost pure water ice and trace amounts of uh, carbon dioxide, ammonia, light harder carbons. Uh, and we're going to have a look at that in, in more detail. So if we look at the geological structure of Enceladus, now this, this is diagrammatic. The, these layers are not, not to scale, but I think it's quite helpful just to see it. So we have an, uh, an ice crust, a global ocean, and then this rocky core, uh, and the South Pole, of course, with the active jets that we're going to have a look at. Now, this global ocean uh, is alkaline. Uh, early estimates were of a pH of 9 to 11, but more recently, it looks like it's nearer to 9, 9.5, uh, but an alkaline ocean, nevertheless. Salt water, very similar to our own uh, oceans in, in many respects, and we'll take a look at that. Uh, organic matter or organic uh, compounds. And it's about um, six miles deep beneath the southern polar ocean uh, under this ice crust, which does vary in thickness as, as the Earth's crust does. Uh, in this case, it's, it's about uh, three to 22 miles thick. Uh, by contrast, the Earth crust, clearly of, of silicate minerals, uh, varies from 15 to, to 35 kilometers. So in some respects, it's comparable in, the, in terms of thickness, but clearly the composition is, is, is very different. And in this uh, false color image, um, you can quite clearly see the South Pole. And the ice crust thickness uh, does vary, as, as I've mentioned there. Um, but in the equatorial regions, it, it, it's really quite thick, about 22 miles thick. And you can quite clearly see these, these cratered regions. But in the south, it, it's less than three miles thick. In fact, some recent data suggested it's even as thin as two miles thick. So there's a clear differential uh, within the planet, within the moon itself, of, 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 this, um, of this crustal thickness, which in itself then leads on to some deductions or conclusions uh, about the evolution of, of the moon. And we'll come to that. So um, we can see that the um, polar regions vary in, in composition. Um, it can be quite quite young. Uh, some of the surface is, is quite young. We'll have a look at that. Uh, and parts of the surface have melted and refrozen in the recent geolo geological past. And you can see in the area here on the northern hemisphere, really quite smooth plains, but no craters to speak of at all. And even in this southern pole, which is you very much eyes are distracted by these fractures again false color um, but outside the fractures you can see there's very few craters in this area and that implies that Enceladus has had several 
area, uh, active areas, not just the South Pole, but across the moon itself, where we've had ice erupted or discharged, much as we get lava flows discharged, uh, or we see lava flows on, on remnants of those on the moons um, and, and on Earth. But this must be quite young because the very nature of Enceladus implies that there's tectonic activity, which is rare in, in, in the solar system, and that the surface is continually being refreshed in, in different active areas. So if we have a look at um, this in, in, in more detail, we can see these, these so-called tiger stripes, uh, the four main ridges here. They're tectonic features, they're, they're surrounded by boulders of, of ice uh, and, and probably um, bedrock boulders as well. I'll show you a picture of those in a minute. About um, 80 miles long, spaced around about 25 miles apart. Um, and this is the area that I found most intriguing, that they're very young uh, and between 10 and 1,000 years old at all is the estimate. And part of the rationale, the reasoning for that, uh, are those early voyage images, but these were not seen. There were some fractures observed, such as these fractures here, but you recall from that early image, these features were not seen and certainly not as prominently as this. So we're looking at a, a, at a body that is tectonically active, it, is continually refreshing it, its surface, and is really uh, quite intriguing in terms of that, that structure. And if we look at this uh, in more detail, this is 20 kilometers, you can see little spots or dots on this image through going through the center here. And, and it's thought that these are uh, boulders of ice, but also possibly pockets of bedrock or pods of bedrock up uh, like nanotex rising above the, the ice floor. Uh, and the uh, sizes range from, you know, dozens to uh, hundreds of feet, so tens to thousands of, uh, of hundreds of meters. So really quite significant in, in, in size. And, and just to show you some of these really spectacular images uh, uh, of, the, of the fractures, this is approximately two uh, miles, three kilometers. And you can see these, these stripes, sort of false colored, but uh, these stripes that we saw, uh, and within them, significant fractures. And, and even with the outside the stripes, you can see deep fractures within, this is all South Pole. So really quite spectacular features, uh, as well as some craters that have clearly been eroded as well or uh, weathered. This is an artist's impression, but I put it on for a bit of fun. Uh, it's certainly not a, uh, an ice crevice you'd want to fall into, uh, but it gives you a sense of the, the surface of the, of, of the moon. So I mentioned it's tectonically active, and this is uh, quite unusual, but it's also, of course, the cause of, of um, you know, why the, the surface of, of the moon is continually changing and, and refreshing the surface through ice eruptions. Um, and I've got some examples here of these fractures, that the tensions within the fractures, it could be some lateral tensions or, or some transverse tensions. Uh, splitting these fractures or moving the fractures. As, and we see this on Earth in, in different um, environments. Uh, and this is an example from the East Pacific rise. Uh, and you can see here transformed faults, so fractures, which are pulling apart the surface of, of the ridge. And of course, that's where the black smokers are. We'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, and you can see clear parallels on Enceladus here in, in the fractures. In fact, quite remarkable. Uh, uh, structures that are, are comparable in, in size uh, as well as structure. So a very active uh, moon. Um, and, and this becomes even more evident if, if we take a look at the uh, temperature or infrared imaging uh, of, of different hemispheres of, of the moon. Um, anticipated temperatures, uh, this distance from the, from the sun, was it was expected to be around about minus 200 Celsius. But measurements from Cassini saw that in these active regions, it, it, it reaches something like 93 Celsius. So much higher heat flows than, than anticipated um, and, and particularly prominent, of course, in the Southern Hemisphere. 
But what I'd like you to see is in the Northern Hemisphere, this residual heat flow here. And, and it's thought that um, within you know, that thousand, 2000 years, that the North Pole was also active in much the same way that the South Pole was. So we, we're, it, it's intriguing because we're getting heat flows that vary across the, the moon. Uh, and if we, were, if we were to draw an analogy of, of, of magma chambers, and you think of the Hawaiian Island chain is a good example of this, where the magma chamber underneath the crust of the earth is actually in convection and it, it's moving within the mantle uh, and therefore the heat flow is moving. So if you look at the Hawaiian Islands, the, currently it's the big island that is continually erupting. But the other islands have had periods of volcanicity as well. But they're less active or dormant now because that magma chamber has moved. And it's intriguing to postulate that there's something similar happening uh, on Enceladus with, with this convection of, of heat and heat flows within the, within the planet or within the uh, interior of the moon. Now, I did come across one paper. Um, I don't think this is uh, necessarily well accepted, but I thought I'd include it just as for, for interest, really. There has been a suggestion that Enceladus axis of rotation has been, has been shifted by 55 degrees, uh, possibly by um, a collision with a, a, an asteroid, uh, asteroid in, in deep space. Um, the evidence for that it, it was, was somewhat, somewhat vague, and it's more of a postulation than a, a, a solid evidence base for this. But it is quite intriguing uh, that you know, something like that could have happened. And it, it, it's something that's another, really requires some additional work to, to uh, get some evidence base for this, for this suggestion. But let's turn now to the really spectacular features of Enceladus, and that's these geysers. Uh, many images of, of this really quite spectacular. Uh, uh, showing these these plumes uh, that have been discharged in, into space, uh, creating that E-ring as, as we saw earlier. Um, you can see this image shows really quite well that these plumes are really quite quite narrow, quite thin in terms of the, er, the erupted material. Uh, and as we'll see, Cassini flew through these and took samples of them. Now, because they are quite quite thin, if you like, quite quite narrow, not very dense material, then the amount of, of, of analysis uh, of man particles that were available for analysis are relatively few. But nevertheless, we, we, we've got some really quite intriguing data uh, from this. But I want just to clarify this uh, pronunciation. Um, this is a geyser, and that's a geyser. And, and the term geyser comes from Icelandic. Uh, and it was uh, 18th century Icelandic, really just naming the geyser. Uh, and it's Icelandic to, to gush or in some interpretations to flow. So that's the reason of the, uh, of the pronunciation and it's, um, it's important to some people, but there we are. So let's take a look at these tiger stripes uh, again, another uh, thermal image. Uh, and you can see these on the left-hand side, these um, yellow uh, uh, stars here, identify the, the most active uh, geysers um, on, the, on the moon. Now, those are the most active uh, and, and uh, producing the, the uh, highest density and greatest height of plumes. But there are over 101 identified uh, geysers along these, these fractures, as, as you would anticipate. Um, uh, you know, as we see on the Earth, it's fractures that allow magma to come to the surface. Well, in a similar way, it's fractures that are allowing these, these uh, plumes to come to the surface. Now, the different size of circles, for those of you who uh, know stats, uh, these re reflect the level of uncertainty of the position of the geyser. And these, these circles are sort of one sigma errors. Um, but more importantly, it really just maps out the positions of the geysers. And as for the colors, well, I went back to the original paper and I couldn't find it. There must be an explanation for them, but unfortunately it wasn't in the key and it wasn't in the body of the paper. So I'm afraid I'm as intrigued as you are as to why they're the colored in that way. Uh, there's been really quite an extraordinary amount of work done on, on these uh, principal geysers. And this is th the 36 that was studied in detail. 
And the red dots and the blue dots really just reflect whether the ice particles that have been emitted uh, are, uh, are in the lead of, of Enceladus or trail Enceladus. And the lines that you can see here uh, just show the large or the principal direction of, of the eruption. Um, interesting um, from our point of view, I'm not sure how much value that adds to our understanding, but it's, it's interesting. If nothing else, eventually this may lead to some interpretation of the internal uh, near surface structures of, of uh, Enceladus. So let's look at the, the, the model then, as you've probably gathered as we've been going through. This is the sort of structure we're, we're talking about. There's some parallels with, with Earth, but, but the model based on the geophysics and the geochemistry, uh, uh, I think is, a, is very sound. So we've got this ice shell, uh, this crust uh, at the top, and it's quite nice, this diagram, because it shows it thinning at uh, the equivalent of a mid-Atlantic ridge or East Pacific ridge uh, as these eruptions are, are taking place. Uh, a deep ocean uh, and a rocky core, which is subject to uh, hydroth um, hydrothermal circulation of, of the fluids and subsequent eruption through hot springs uh, uh, and jets at the surface of the ocean. And, and just to explain why there even should be some thermal um, uh, convection within the core. Uh, it, it's because of Enceladus' position closest to uh, uh, close to Saturn. It's that tidal um, um, stretching, uh, that tidal energy, that creates this this movement within Enceladus. Intriguingly, we don't see that in the uh, moons either side of Enceladus. So there's another paradox there that uh, requires some investigation. So these uh, these jets here are emitting ice particles, and as we'll see in a moment, uh, particles of silica. So there would be, in, in Earth terms, we would call them white smokers. The black smokers emit sulfide minerals, typically iron and nickel sulfides. Um, these are emitting uh, uh, silica and, and ice particles, so white smokers. We've seen the images of the plumes on the surface. And, and interestingly, uh, the composition of the rocky core um, there's some good evidence for that, uh, but regardless of the actual specifics, we know there'll be water-rock interactions, because soon as water penetrates through the, the, the crust uh, and, and comes into contact with bedrock, uh, so reactions take place, weathering takes place, uh, and, and the minerals themselves are changed and the composition of the fluid is changed. And a good analogy um, would, would be Iceland where the, the hot springs uh, and the geysers there uh, are not fresh water, uh, as we'll see in New Zealand, but it's entrained seawater because obviously uh, Iceland was created uh, on, on a, a Atlantic ridge and, and it's a, a, a very active um, volcanic island. But the waters that are, that are within the circulation of the geothermal systems in Iceland are salt water, not fresh water. So it's a good analogy here. So I did a lot of work on, on geothermal geochemistry in New Zealand over several years. Uh, it was based at a, a United Nations funded institute. Uh, and we did a lot of work there with, with uh, mature scientists and engineers from developing nations. And as a consequence, we got some good insights into worldwide geothermal systems. Uh, and the reason why I, I, I really like chemistry of fluids and the mineral assemblages is because they fingerprint the, uh, the nature of the environment or the paleo environment in which they're created. And so we can get insights into the geology of, of the bedrock. We certainly can uh, determine the uh, temperature of the reservoir, the geothermal reservoir at, at depth. And I'll show you how we can do that in a moment. Um, the chemistry can also give us some insights into whether the biogeochemical reactions take place. Uh, at depth or more probably near surface. Uh, and, and on a wider basis, it can give us some insights into uh, planetary history and geological evolution. And, and of course, that's where I really find what I really find exciting as, as, as a planet's atmosphere, planet's oceans, and aquatic systems evolve to the chemistry of, of, of the rocks 
uh, and the fluids change as, as well. So I just wanted to show you some images of some of the geothermal systems in New Zealand I worked on. Uh, partly just to give you a bit of a feel for what these things look like. Now, clearly these are on the surface, not, not submarine. Um, the hot water reservoirs are at about seven to 10 kilometers depth um, and are at 360 degrees thereabouts, sometimes a bit higher, sometimes a bit lower. Uh, and because they're so hot and at depth, then they can be used to generate electricity because as the water comes up through, through wells or boreholes, um, it flashes to steam and it's the steam that turns turbines. Um, in terms of, of uh, the age of the waters that we're, we're looking at, um, and this always used to send a shiver down my spine as I was sampling these, these waters, the fellas were in about 10,000 years ago. Uh, and it takes 10,000 years to penetrate down to seven, 10 kilometers depth, and then to, through convection to rise back to the surface. So although geothermal systems are often described as renewable energy, well, yes, it's renewable on a geological time scale, but it's not on a human time frame. And there have been geothermal systems that have effectively been sucked dry and, and have no water left and are, and are dead shells. And it's quite sad to, to see them. So these systems here, uh, there's a range of different ones, uh, um, Waimangu, uh, Wairaki, um, this is this one here is is an interesting one. It's Waitapu. Um, it's the only one um, in New Zealand. It might be the only one in the world that actually deposits this orange uh, sediment here. Uh, and this is a colloidal sediment. It's of arsenic and antimony sulfides, which in themselves is quite interesting. Uh, but it's also very enriching gold. Um, not at mineable quantities, but from a geological perspective, it's extraordinarily rich. The colours you can see. Uh, here, the typically yellows, um, uh, and this one here is a Raki Caraco. Um, th this is algae, and all the systems have algae to a greater or less, well, most of the systems have algae growing um, in the flow systems to a greater or less extent. Th these algae are really quite extraordinary. Firstly, they can live in you know, very hot temperatures, obviously, but interestingly, they're very specific to a temperature range. So some of these algae, if you're walking down flow uh, down a, a effectively a hot spring river, uh, you will see the, change, the algae change color. And that's because some of these algae are very specific to with one or two degrees Celsius. Uh, and, and once it gets hotter or cooler, uh, they can't survive in that environment. So very specific extremophiles. Um, so really quite interesting features. You can see some of the geysers. And the other thing I wanted to mention was this coloration of the pool. Here is this turquoise color. Here on the bottom right, this greenish color. That's caused by uh, colloidal silica suspended within the sediments. And, and uh, that's, that's a really important feature because it creates these so-called sinters, uh, the, these um, silica, silica crusts and cliffs and mounds. These are, these are cliffs of silica built up over time. Um, and, the, and the lifespan of a geothermal system, well, it does vary, of course, from the geological conditions. But if you think around about 10,000 years, that gives you a feel for what we're talking about, sometimes perhaps half that. So this makes it really quite intriguing when you see on Enceladus systems that might only be lasting for 10 or 1,000 years, very different time frame. So we're not going to go into this in detail. I just wanted to show you what a geochemical geothermometer looks like. They're based on the solubility of key minerals. So here, the silica one is for quartz. There's another one for amorphous silica because that has a different solubility. And equally here for two different feldspars, potassium feldspar and a, a sodium rich feldspar. Um, so we can deduce from the chemistry of the waters and put it into these equations, which have been evolved through observation and experiment. And it gives us the temperature at, at depth uh, in the reservoir. So it's really quite helpful. And, and eventually it'd be nice to be able to calibrate such things for off-world geysers uh, chemistry as well. And I was really lucky as a grad student because uh, it was whilst I was uh, start, just started my, my doctoral studies, the black smokers at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge were discovered. Uh, and these are some of the images. As I say, these are black smokers because these are sulfide minerals being discharged. 
And of course, once we started to understand the structures that form around the, these smokers and the features that they produce and the, and the sediments that they deposit, so we can then look back at geological systems uh, through time and actually identify these features. And this is just an example of a paper I wrote many years ago now on features in Northeast Scotland, which I was able retrospectively to start to look at and identify actually the, these were produced by uh, hot spring systems, typically in the Devonian times so of 400 million years ago, uh, heated by these respective granites um, from the uh, Caledonian neurogeny. So that's the sort of context that we can draw upon when we're interpreting these, these systems. So if we look at the, the guys of plume geochemistry, here again, we've got a slightly different diagram, but the same, they've got the hot rocks in convection, uh, tidal heating, uh, we've got the, the pressurized uh, water uh, and vents to the surface as well. And, and the discharge of, of vi um, water vapor, ice particles, uh, and silica particles as well. And within this water vapor, we've got dissolved uh, and insoluble chemicals as well. We'll take a look at those uh, as well. Uh, the Cassini made seven flybys, so not many uh, through the plumes. And as I say, there's not a lot of material there for sampling. So there's still a lot of gaps in our understanding, but it's remarkable that we've been able to achieve so much. And of course, as I've indicated, they give insights into the chemistry of the open, of the ocean, and the deeper geothermal fluids. So let's just take a little time here to do as well. Uh, methane, uh, ammonia, and hydrogen. And I'm going to focus primarily on uh, in discussion on methane and hydrogen uh, as well, a little bit on, on, on ammonia. You can see raft, we're not going to go into this in detail, but a whole group of, of uh, organic compounds, hydrocarbons, um, nitrogen bearing organics as well. Um, and that, of course, is, is intriguing in its own right. Uh, and we'll, we'll have a look at what we might deduce from that. And the eagle eyed amongst you will have spotted in these others um, uh, phosphine, pH 3 which not so long ago caused great excitement uh, in that it might be indi an indicator for life in the clouds of Venus. Um, and, and yes, it can be um, uh, indicator of life, but it can also be produced by uh, acid interacting with uh, iron rich minerals or even native iron particles, which is what I suspect happens in, in Venus. Uh, but that's a, a treat for another day, I think. So let's just start to take a look. I won't be putting too many graphs on here, but I just want to show you some uh, some indications of how we might come to the conclusions that have that have been made. So silica, we've we, we've seen from those, those diagrams of, of, of uh, photographs of New Zealand um, and and the the geothermometer equation. Why this is quite an important um, uh, compound. Um, we know that hot water, uh, mineral rich emerging from hydrothermal vents on the seafloor, it, it, it's emerging into much colder waters and, and silica will precipitate. I mean, it does this on Earth and we know it will do that uh, on Enceladus. And we know that simply because those particles are in, in the plumes. Um, and we can start to have a look, we won't go to this in detail, but what I want to show you is this diagram of, of temperature against uh, the sum of um, SiO2 concentration. And that's, in all its different species um, that uh, is, is uh, you know, dissolved silica, silicious acid, and, and, and uh, sodium bisilicate. Um, and we can see that uh, using minerals uh, as, as buffers, as boundaries of the environment in which this must be created, uh, and looking at pH 9 and then again at, at pH 11, we, we can see that it's in this zone here, this shaded gray zone, that this looks to be the environment in which the silica particles are created. And that's important because it gives us these boundaries of, of the temperature at depth of, you know, just, well, 175, 150, 175, uh, right through up to uh, 200 Celsius, or maybe even higher. Um, and that's, that's quite significant because that's starting to give us a handle on the, on the structure and the temperature of, of the hydrothermal systems that we could be looking at. 
And although there's, there's not enough data to go into this in detail, apart from the fact that these have been detected, we also know that there are salt grains in, in the plumes and sodium in the salt grains it is, is important. Not enough to, go, to draw many conclusions on it, but we know that it must, um, it, it's evidence of that rock water interaction. So sodium chloride, sodium bicarbonate, sodium carbonate and potassium chloride have been detected in these, in these salt grains. And, and that rock water interaction again is important. We've got analogies with, with earth, um, but it also indicates to us that the, the rocks at depth are so-called ultramafic rocks. So rocks that are mainly composed of dark minerals, so olivine, pyroxene, chromite. Um, and when these rocks come into contact with, with seawater or, or water, um, a process called serpentinization takes place. Now, there are examples of serpentinites in, in, in Shetland, uh, some of which are really soft and were used by Vikings to create uh, so-called soapstone, to create carved, to create dishes and so on. And it, it, what happens is, is that the, the solid rock becomes um, really sort of hydrated and, and oxidized, uh, and it produces a range of different minerals as well. And in doing that, Water, which is the oxidizing agent, providing oxygen, that gets reduced to hydrogen. And there are other chemical reactions that take place that combine with that hydrogen, inorganic reactions to produce methane. And there are other reactions uh, uh, as well that will produce um, uh, extraordinary substances like native iron, uh, which we don't really see on the surface of the earth because of oxidation, uh, and a range of organic compounds. But if we just focus on silica, and hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen molecule. This is really quite significant. So we've got the tidal heating again. We've got the water penetrating to depth and reacting with these, uh, th these ultramafic rocks, these iron bearing rocks that get serpentinized. And, we, and as a result, hydrogen gets entrained into the, into the um, uprising uh, water. Reaction with the quartz bearing carbonate rocks. I haven't gone into that in detail, but there's some evidence uh, of, of carbonaceous rocks there as well. And that gets entrained into the plume and then discharged into the ocean water as molecular hydrogen and silica, and again into the atmosphere or through the plumes. So that's a sort of broad model that, that we're looking at here. So we've already got through this uh, silica indication and boundaries that we can be looking at here uh, temperatures in this zone, the centralized zone of 150, 200 Celsius, which is quite significant. Now methane, of course, is, is uh, always a, a source of great interest. It can be biogenic, it can be inorganic as well. Um, and uh, there's, there was some modeling done because we know, as I've just indicated, serpentinization can create methane. But on the mass balance modeling that was done, the amount of methane that Cassini detected was far higher than could be explained just by this rock water interaction. And that's really quite intriguing. So what's the, what's the options of it? And, and just actually before I go into that, the, the Methane itself is thought to be encased within water molecules or trapped within water molecules, which is how it gets into the, the plumes rather than dissipating uh, through diffuse um, emissions. And that's how it was, was detected. Well, the options that are under, under consideration is it actually could be primordial methane uh, from uh, Enceladus original formation, trapped within the core and, and actually bubbling up through that and get, then getting trapped within the water molecules and ice particles. Or, of course, it could be anaerobic mo uh, microbes uh, at work, metabolizing hydrogen to create methane. And, and we do know from, from vents on Earth that, uh, that hydrogen is a food source for microbes, uh, so-called uh, methogenins. These, these eat hydrogen and carbon dioxide and produce methane. Well, we know we've got hydrogen and we know we've got carbon dioxide. Uh, and we know that they're found on Earth around deep sea uh, hydrothermal vents. So it's not something that could be readily written off. Given this mass balance calculation, there needs to be another 
explanation, and it could be either or both of these. And at the moment, it's of course uncertain. Now, of course, organic compounds also cause a great deal of interest, um, and that again they're produced at depth and diffused through the hydrothermal vents um, or into the uh, ice grains, and actually in this case appear to condense on the ice grains and get entrained in, in that way. So they, they um, uh, effectively freeze onto the grains of, of, of the ice and get blown into space on the plumes and are then detected. And we saw there's a whole range of different organic compounds from large insoluble complex molecules, which appear to, uh, as postulated, they float on the surface and are then entrained within the ice crystals, but also uh, soluble uh, organics as well, they'll get entrained into the ice particles as well. So two different mechanisms, depending on whether the organics are soluble or insoluble. So um, this leads us back to, well, you know, we've got some good data on the chemistry of these plumes that have given us some good indications of the structure of Enceladus uh, and the processes and the geological processes that are taking place. Can they give us an insight into the origin of the moon? And, and, and there are three sort of alternatives that have been put forward. Uh, it could be accreted over an extended period of time uh, in a, a nebula around Saturn, uh, was formed up towards the end of the uh, protosolar nebula, and then uh, entrained within that, uh, uh, these uh, satellite, um, sort of small precursors to satellites, which accumulate to uh, within the gaseous disk to, to create the, the satellite. So it's just a simple accretionary period that we're, we're, we're used to. It could have formed from later accretion of particles that were already in the, the, the rings of Saturn. Uh, and that's another possibility. Uh, or there's a, another one that it might be actually a recreated moon that was uh, uh, really torn apart, uh, a mid-sized satellite that was torn apart what became unstable uh, under the gravitational pull of, of Saturn. That latter one hasn't been ruled out, but seems to not be the most favored. Well, uh, as many of you will know, we can use isotopes to fingerprint the origin of, of waters. Uh, you know, we can, on Earth, we can use the deuterium hydrogen ratio to identify the latitude at which rain falls. Uh, and, and we can fingerprint the origins of, of, of waters uh, as well. So there was sufficient material for uh, deuterium hydrogen ratios to be um, uh, analyzed. There wasn't enough for uh, oxygen isotopes and not enough for argon isotopes or nitrogen isotopes to, to uh, be determined. But nevertheless, uh, even though there's not a lot of data, it's still quite intriguing to look at uh, the, these ratios for Enceladus. Um, and you can see from the plot, uh, here's Earth, here's the projected protosolar nebula uh, and the, the gas giants, Titan Enceladus. These are uh, the uh, deuterium hydrogen ratios for comets from the Oort cloud, uh, these from the Jupiter family. And what this shows is that Enceladus is clearly in a, in, in a grouping, possibly with Titan, but, but it's largely out on its own. Between the Oort cloud materials and the chondritic materials, and that in itself is quite intriguing. And, and it's intriguing when we start to look at the CO2, methane, and, and ammonia content, and it, not, the, not the absolute concentration, but the relative proportions, that these relative abundances uh, are comparable to that which we see in cometary ice. But clearly, if it was just, if Enceladus was purely cometary material, then it was most likely it would be much more within this Oort cloud banding or very close to it. It clearly isn't. And it's clearly uh, not entirely made of uh, accretion of chronditic material, despite some of the carbonate uh, signatures that we see. It looks to be a hybrid between the two. It's indicative, it's not conclusive, but it's certainly intriguing that the origin of Enceladus is a mixture between uh, accretion of chondritic material and it added to subsequently by cometary material. And that looks like quite a powerful argument. 
but there's a lot of a lot more isotopic work would would confirm or or reject that. So the hypothesis the hypothesis put forward, and I've put some references here, and I'll give you the book uh, reference at the end. Um, is that the solids uh, are largely protosolar in nature, trapped, uh, and then probably with a common origin with comets and perhaps with some of the carbonaceous asteroids. So a bit of a mix there, uh, which come together to be accreted, transported from that Oort cloud area into that sort of mid-satellite, what they call mid-satellite um, or mid-sized satellite feeding zone. But importantly, it does. It looks like it's accreted and been projected there without significant chemical or isotopic interaction with the Saturn subnebula gases. And I think that's really quite intriguing. And remember, Enceladus is different from its neighboring moons as well in terms of composition. So the, the, there's some intriguing stories here that still have yet to be uh, determined. So what about life on Enceladus? Uh, well, we've seen these black smokers uh, and, and, and we know uh, that there are unique ecosystems around these black smokers. And these are examples of the tube worms that are not found anywhere else. They, they feed uh, uh, on vent bacteria um, and, uh, and the infrared, infrared energy um, from, from the hot springs area. And I rather think that my professors will be spinning in their grave if, uh, uh, as I'm using Jurassic Park as, a, as an authority. Uh, but if you, if you Google life finds a way in Jurassic Park, you get this really good clip from, uh, from Jeff Goldblum in which he does the, the spot, postulating on life. And he uses this phrase, life finds a way. Uh, and that always struck a chord with me because it does. You know, we're looking at these extremophiles. You had a very good talk recently about extremophiles. But, um, you know, these, just, just this example I've got pictures of here, these are extremophiles. We've got uh, examples of, of algae uh, from the Kola borehole, uh, 11 kilometer deepest borehole ever drilled, fractures within that have uh, desiccated algae within them, rehydrate, come back to life. Life does find a way, it's quite extraordinary. And, and I haven't, this is not my real area of, of research, but I did do a little bit of, of work uh, on one geothermal, well, actually several geothermal systems, but this is one I want to pick out uh, in this context. And this, this hot spring is one of many in a geothermal field called Takanu. It's on the flanks of Ruapea volcano. And, and it is extraordinarily rich in silica, as you can see, just or infer from the coloration of, of the water and, of, and huge deposits of silica center around these, these waters. And we were interested in, in these because you know, on most um, hot spring areas, when you take in samples from them, you can see that the, that the vent uh, really closes down, you know, uh, you know, tens of meters. It becomes really just, just almost like a hose pipe to the depths of the earth, um, not really broad uh, aperture at all. But these systems are really quite eerie. It, it's almost sort of like a bottomless loch and that, you know, we were sampling 500 meters down and it was still of this sort of size dimension, a real tube to the center of the earth. So good Arnie Sacknessum some stuff there. Um, but interesting, we, so we filtered these just to get some insights into the, into the waters and composition. And what we found were these uh, creatures living in this, this water, these are boiling by the way, uh, at, at surface temperature, uh, a range of different materials, some, some just uh, amorphous silica grains and, and, and strings of amorphous silica, but also these diatoms. This, by the way, uh, is, a, is a pollen grain that's clearly fallen into the pool. And, and diatoms are really quite intriguing. This scan hasn't really come out too well, so I'll just show you a picture of diatoms. Uh, and there's a reference here if you want to, to, to know more about them. They're really, I mean, they're beautiful creatures, microscopic creatures. These are electron microscope pictures that, that I was showing you. Um, and uh, I'll just uh, tease you uh, in that the first occurrence is recorded in the Jurassic. It's just a bit of fun. And, um, but intriguingly, the, the only organism that has cell walls of, of uh, transparent opaline silica. Uh, and they survive in any aquatic environment on Earth. 
they really are quite they're very diverse many many different life uh, forms but they really are survivors now we couldn't determine whether they were living at depth or near, near the surface of these these hot springs we just didn't have the sampling equipment uh, that would that would enable us to capture and preserve um, water samples fr from the depths of sort of a kilometer that we, we really wanted to do but nevertheless it's quite intriguing and if nothing else it does show that life can live in these these systems uh, and, and, and we know that from these extraordinary ecosystems that we see around the, the vents on on earth so if we go back to Encelas, um let's just take a a checklist uh, for the elements of life well we've got this thermal environment that we know from, from analogies with Earth can create the environment for, for life. We know we've got a food source for, for microbial activity, uh, molecular hydrogen. We know we've got complex organic molecules, which are not in themselves amino acids. None of those have been detected, but they are the building blocks for amino, amino acids. And again, we heard a really good talk about organic molecules. And, and you know, it, it's when uh, these start to form lipids that we might start to think of life as uh, as we know it and of course we've got water aquatic environment as well and and it's it's highly probable that we've got the cometary contributions to to these as well so we have certainly the the possibility of the environment and, and the the basic elements to come together to create life and we already know on earth that that we have these compounds the, the, sorry these the, these microbes that are specific to uh, consuming hydrogen and producing methane that we've detected and are detected at a level that is higher than would be expected from inorganic reactions. So it raises the imposs intriguing possibility that they're already here, that the, the methogenins already exist on, on Enceladus. And these are images of uh, examples from Earth. Um, unfortunately, there are no more uh, missions scheduled yet to investigate this intriguing possibility, but it remains really quite exciting. Uh, and as well as Europa, Enceladus is a real target for life, uh, as well as just very intriguing geological and geochemical systems. If you'd like to learn more, uh, a couple of references here. There um, was a conference in 2016 uh, of uh, really about Enceladus and looking at the, the data from this. And I put a link here, it's quite convoluted, um, but you'll get the slides uh, or the PDF of the slides, so you can copy that. Um, you can download the, the conference um, abstract volume uh, for free. It, uh, uh, it's a variable quality, candidly. Some of the papers abstracts are not that great, but there are some really interesting ones in there. And the better papers were uh, uh, two years later published uh, as, as a book by the uh, Lunar and Planetary Institute which hosted the conference. And again, I've put a link here. Um, you can, uh, from Google Books, you can actually get a preview of 100 pages um, to see if it's something that you might want to purchase, about 60 pounds. Um, it is a technical book, it is academic. These are academic papers, uh, some of which are, uh, are really quite specialist, but there are elements in it that are amenable to, to the general reader as, as well. Um, and it's really an excellent, excellent volume. So thank you very much. I shall uh, stop sharing. Uh, and that was fabulous, uh, Keith. Really yeah. looking some fascinating stuff there. Uh, there you go. I know there's a few questions that appeared in the chat. Okay, there we go. From, from David Ray. Uh, the, uh, the number of people we've got here tonight, there, there, there's a couple of options here. Uh, folk that have questions, they can either pop them into the, the, the Q and, uh, sorry, into the chat and we can read them from there. Or if it's easier for you, then just stick up your hand and you can unmute and ask the, the question direct. So we, we can do it either way, I think. Probably while people are thinking of uh, other questions and uh, the best way to ask them, uh, as David has put quite a few 
uh, questions there. I'll probably go to run through them just now. I don't know if you're able to, to read them, Keith, or do you want us to read them no. out to you? Uh, oh, yes. No, no, my eyesight's terrible. You better read them out. Yeah, well, I was kind of hoping you weren't going to say that. <laughs> it might <laughs> much better. Oh, okay. Right. I'm, I'm, oh, wait a minute. I can, I can do some. Go no, on. no. Go uh, on, for, first one, the density of olivine varies uh, 3.2 to 4.3. If the density of Enceladus is 1.6, then what is the proportion of olivine in the rocky core? Well, that's a that's a good question, isn't it? That that uh, that's a really specialist question. And the honest answer is, I don't know. I haven't seen I haven't seen data that that shows that relative proportion uh, of of the respective minerals. And remember, it, it, this is done through remote sensing rather than sampling. Uh, so I haven't seen any sort of what we might call mixing models that uh, that we could use to to draw upon that. Um, it's a really good question. Uh, but sorry, uh, I haven't seen any data that would give any insights into that. Okay, excellent. Uh, next one, again from David. Is the orbit of Enceladus inclined to the plane of the rings, including that of the E-ring? No, it isn't. It, it's within the plane of the rings. Um, and um, some, some of the images show, show it sl slightly... Um, I think it's more perspective than, than the reality. Some of the images show it's sort of floating above the E-ring, but it actually does orbit in the plane of the E-ring. Okay. Uh, a quick question on that one before I move on to David's next one. So, so I'm assuming Enceladus is, is essentially smack bang in the middle of the, the E-ring then. That's right. That's yeah. right. You see, so there was one of those images uh, which showed the, the, uh, the diffuse nature of the ring. Yeah. But it's more concentrated around the orbit of Enceladus, as you might anticipate. Yeah. Okay, uh, but I suppose what I was asking was uh, the, the the ring. Obviously, it's quite diffuse. Yeah, uh, Enceladus is not at the outer edge of the inner no, edge; it's no. sort of in, in it. Okay. That's right. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, next one from David: Do calculations of the amount of tidal heating generated by the interaction with Saturn support the figure of 150 to 200 degrees C? Yes, it do. Um, uh, and I haven't looked into um, that, sort of, shall we say, the geophysical modeling of that tidal heating. I was more interested in the um, uh, fluid chemistry and, and deductions from that. Um, but the, that, that, uh, geological structure and the uh, hydrothermal modeling and projected convection uh, bring all that data together uh, and, and it's reinforced by the chemistry. So it, it, it's not just the, the uh, chemistry of silica that we, we're using as a conclusion for that. Okay. So uh, hopefully David, that's, that's answered those three questions for you. Um, noticing there might be some other questions that are not in the in the chat. Uh, now these are ones I can't see. Ian, uh, do you have access to them that you can you can read them out? I don't have any other questions that I can see. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. There's, there's nothing in through Facebook or that then. Very good. No, let me okay, that's that's that, that's fine. I'm, I'm I'm just misreading messages here. That's that's why oh, I'm right. squinting at the <laughs> another feeling at the chat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I would not only be squinting; I'd be sticking my face right to the camera. So that's not a good look. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A, a couple of comments from Pauline and from. Uh, Peter uh, from the Inverness and Aberdeen Societies is uh, a very good talk. And uh, Peter mentions uh, much more uh, going on with Enceladus than, than he knew about. I, I, I would agree with, entirely with that. Uh, certainly from the, the Cassini mission images, it, it, it stood out as a particularly interesting 
object uh, in the orb in the orbit of Saturn. Uh, but um, what you've talked about today has shed quite a lot of new light on it for me. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that you, you did cover the correct pronunciation of uh, Geyser. Uh, yeah, I, something I, I, about, I've always got mixed up uh, over, but uh, I, I, after the slide that you put up, I'll, I'll never <laughs> never have a problem remembering that in future. So, so thanks for that. Okay, is, is there any other questions that anyone has? Nope. Yeah, I, I've, got, I've got a question from a, a received via other channels. So David Orr is having technical okay. difficulties. Is asked uh, uh, if there is also a question on the moon in front of the E ring. On the moon, for, sorry, is there a key? Is there also a question on the moon from the E ring? So, in other words, the the the, the ejected particles that create the E-ring uh, are then consolidating or accumulating back onto the moon. Um, and uh, that, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, I, I think at its highest density, that, that ring is still quite diffuse. But of course, Enceladus is passing through that. So, there's, so one would expect that to, to, to be the case. And it, it's an intriguing possibility because of course, um, some of the areas of Enceladus um, are really very, very smooth. But uh, if it was just through accretion, then we'd see that more on the leading edge than, than on the, the other hemispheres, and, and that's not the case. So I would anticipate that there is um, uh, accumulation through the orbit, but remember these are nano-sized particles, so they're very, very fine, uh, and it really just falling as, well, ice crystals. So it wouldn't really be very distinctive, wouldn't create any very distinctive features. Okay, that, that's, that's a really good question from David, because I know one of the other uh, moons of Saturn, I think it's Iapetus, yeah. uh, it has a, a distinctly darker half. And because of tidal walking, it essentially orbits around the, the, the planet with the, the same face in, in front, uh, and uh, I did read somewhere that it was it was uh, described uh, that the, the the front face of Iapetus was collecting debris as it orbited, a bit yeah. like uh, bugs on a windscreen as you're driving along uh, in, in, in the countryside. And do, would, would there be enough collecting there that it might give you an insight into? The, the composition of things inside, or is it just the, the amount that is landing back on the surface is, is, is a bit too low for any sort of direct measurements? Yeah, I think you're right there, Gordon. Uh, uh, it's better, and also, of course, um, the closer you can sample to the source, the less contamination there, there, there can be uh, as well. Um, and, and yes, it's going to be sort of micrometer, sort of layers, um, so not really sufficient. And, and indeed, the, although the instruments typically are in neutral mass specs, but you know, very sensitive, uh, you know, these, these are very diffuse um, plumes uh, on which to do the analysis. There's, there's one point actually I, 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 I didn't mention is, is that because Enceladus is discharging uh, all this material and has been doing so, it, its lifespan is finite because it, it, it will come to a point where it, it's thought that it will just collapse internally and fragment. So there's no time frame on that and, and because it's still just not enough data to do that. But I think that's quite intriguing of a self-destructive process uh, within the moon. <coughs> so um, I don't think I'm spotting any other questions. Have you got any other, Liam? Yeah, D David, do you want to come online and ask your, your follow-up question, or you prefer not to? I'll give you 10, 9, 8, <laughs> 7, 6, 5... That's like 2020. 4, 3, 2, 1. Uh, so David was, David was wondering if there's, uh, what the similarities between um, Enceladus and Karen, uh, Pluto's moon Karen might be as well. <laughs> 
or Charon or Karen or yeah, yeah, I'm mispronouncing I it. I know you, what what you mean. Um, it, it's a, it's it's always interesting to see these um, analogies. Um, I haven't seen that level of, although there's always going to be that, that sort of tidal heating in a lot of bodies, I haven't seen um, data on Sharon that is comparable in terms of the scale of what we see on Enceladus. Um, but it's a good it's a good point. I think that sounds like a, another talk to me um, uh, at, uh, in terms of Sharon itself. But um, well, all I, all I can say is I haven't seen, I've seen analogies, but I haven't seen that one. So I'm unclear if, if that would be viable. 